Uh, so today's second talk is entitled Building a Climate Model. The presenter is Dr. Gary Russell, Senior Climate Researcher at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. His principal area of expertise is development and implementation of mathematically sound numerical techniques for modeling climate change. As principal architect of the GIST climate model, he developed online diagnostics and a physics-based ocean model that have revolutionized the numerical modeling approach to studying global climate change. So when it comes to understanding how to build a climate model, there can be no greater authority than Gary, with whom I've had the pleasure of working for the last 40 years. The mantra we have always had is, if you don't understand something about the climate model, go ask Gary whose knowledge is exceeded only by the patience he has shown in explaining it to us. Gary, thanks for giving this talk and for the opportunity to benefit from your expertise all these years. Okay. Uh, I am? Okay. Uh, my, name is, my name is Gary Lloyd Russell. Okay. My name is Gary Lloyd Russell. I grew up in Buffalo, New York, attended public school, and graduated from the University of Rochester in 1968. I was always good in mathematics, doing well on the high school math contest and the Putnam exam in college. I was admitted into the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Columbia University in mathematics but 1968 was the peak of the Vietnam War draft, and I would not have been allowed to attend graduate school. I was not political in those years, but a friend from Buffalo died in Vietnam, so I was not too keen to join the Army. I landed a computer programming job in May 1968 at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies near Columbia and did obtain a draft deferment because I worked for NASA. I never left GIS. Computer programming is the optimal use of my abilities. And during my first year at GIS, I worked with Yuri Tumre on his star convection model. In 1969, GIS imported the Mintz Arakawa weather model from UCLA a computer program that simulated global weather. Under the direction of Milton Hallam, Anthony Rosati and I were to understand and modify the code. In the early 1970s, the project's purpose was to improve weather forecasting by adding satellite retrieved radiances that would affect the model's temperatures for the days that precede a five-day weather forecast. Improvements were made to subsurface, subsurface reservoirs and source terms, including radiation. In 1976, I received my PhD from Columbia. My thesis was in complex variables with mention to an icosahedral group, uh, which will come into play uh, about 40 years later. At GIS in 1976, I was assigned to work for James Hansen, who wanted to change the weather model to a climate model. This meant century-long simulations with reduced horizontal resolution. During my first year with Hansen, we built the model infrastructure for precise inline monthly diagnostics. Multi-year atmosphere model runs were made overnight on our mainframe computer, and we would pick up the line printer output in the morning. There was a hitch in 1977 when I had a stroke at age 31. But in spite of that, I am in excellent health. The stroke did not affect the logical, spatial, or numerical aspects of my brain, but I did have to relearn to speak. If someone rapidly pronounces a five-digit number or a 10-word sentence, I am un unable to repeat it. 
The original main programming group for climate model development at GIS was Hansen, Andrew Laces, Rado Rudy, and myself. But in 1978, a fast writer and superb meteor meteorologist, David Rind, joined the group. He told us what aspects of the model were working well and what aspects needed work. And he frequently asked for new inline diagnostics to compare with observations. James Hansen was always ahead of other people in understanding what climate models were saying. For many years, people knew about the positive feedbacks in the climate system. The large water vapor and snow ice albedo feedbacks were well understood. But in Early 19, in the early 1980s, I remember Hansen telling a group of scientists from NASA headquarters that the time required for the climate system to approach equilibrium from a forcing is proportional to the feedback factor. I never thought about this and the scientists were skeptical of his hypothesis. But this hypothesis was proved mathematically in our 1984 Ewing Symposium paper. A climate forcing, say additional CO2 added to the atmosphere, causes a climate response. But the feedbacks come into play when the climate responds, not when the forcing is applied. The various climate models throughout the world show a large range in the composite feedback factor for Earth. We are in the early years of CO2 climate forcing, and the feedbacks are just recently coming into play. From present day observations, we do not yet know how large the Earth's actual feedback factor is. There is uncertainty in the fast, in the fast feedbacks, such as clouds, and also slow feedbacks, such as methane emissions from the surface. About 25 years ago, David Randolph from Colorado State University gave a lecture at GIS about icosahedral grids. I have always liked polyhedrons, but I paid little attention to Randolph's lecture. About five years ago, when GIS imported a cubed sphere code, I started looking at non-latitude longitude grids. With David Rhine's help and encouragement, it took a couple of Good years idea. to develop symmetric equations on the sphere. Symmetric equations use three horizontal components for two-dimensional flow and replace velocity with angular momentum, which is continuous over the whole sphere. David and I also realized that an icosahedral grid is superior to a cubed sphere grid. And that is where my interest is now. It is unfortunate that I did not pay attention to Randall many years ago. Uh, slide two. Uh, the left panel shows the vertical structure of a grid cell in the 1983 GIS climate model. Atmospheric composition included the principal radiative active gases water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone, as well as the minor absorbers, such as methane, nitrous oxide, and CFCs. Also included were stratospheric and tropospheric aerosols and multi-layered water and ice clouds. Solar irradiance was programmed with diurnal and seasonal variability. The model surface used six horizontal surface types open ocean, sea ice, open lake, lake ice, ground, and land ice, with variable snow accumulation. There were nine vertical layers up to 10 millibars. The model included latent, sensible, and precipitation heat exchange between the surface and the atmosphere. It conserved water mass and heat content stored in the atmosphere and subsurface reservoirs. The right panel shows the horizontal resolution and surface topography on an 8 degree by 10 degree latitude longitude grid. 
Special geographic areas were selected for regional inline monthly diagnostics for more focused analysis. The four grid boxes shown in black were designated to collect hourly weather type information to assess the model's diurnal cycle. Slide three. The standard version of GIS model E2 coupled atmosphere ocean climate model uh, Schmidt et al. 2014 uses a two degree by 2.5 degree latitude longitude grid but can work at higher or lower resolutions. The standard vertical resolution shown at left is 40 layers with the top model at 0.1 millibars and adjustable layer spacing to provide higher vertical resolution near the surface and tropopause regions of the atmosphere. Model E2 includes all significant radiative thermodynamic and dynamic physical processes and interactions as schematically depicted in the right panel. Numerous model improvements since 1983 include a dynamical ocean, river flow, cloud physics, stratospheric and tropospheric aerosols, and more accurate radiative transfer calculations. Non-standard versions of model E2 include interactive chemistry of aerosols and ozone, dynamic vegetation, a carbon cycle, and stable water isotopes with fractionation, all important aspects of the increasing physical realism in climate model development. Model E2 is an indispensable research tool to study the physical processes of the climate system, to reconstruct historical and geological climate changes, and to understand and predict the climate of our ever evolving planet. Slide four. Seasonal variability of the surface air temperature between January left and July right. Surface temperature best characterizes the prevailing habitability of the biosphere. Animal and plant life is strongly constrained by the surface temperature, even if it lives in the ocean. On a daily basis, surface temperature can undergo large variations due to solar heating by day and thermal radiative cooling at night and it is affected by storms and weather patterns. In general, the sun heats the ground, which in turn heats the atmosphere via sensible, latent, and thermal radiation fluxes. Surface temperature is established as the balance between these competing fluxes and is buffered by the large heat capacity of the ocean or the much smaller heat capacities of the land and atmosphere. Note that the tropical regions remain warm all year long. Continental areas have large seasonal changes while the oceans undergo relatively small changes in temperature. The global mean surface temperature is four degrees centigrade higher in July than in January, even though the July solar irradiance is 6.5% less in January. Slide five. This shows the atmospheric temperature as a function of latitude and altitude for January and July. Temperature decreases steadily with height from the surface until it reaches a minimum temperature at the tropopause, which is somewhere between 12 and 20 kilometers. Above the tropopause, temperature increases with altitude until the, strato until the stratopause near 50 kilometers. After that, beyond the graph, it decreases again until the mesopause near 80 kilometers and finally increasing again into the exosphere. Radiative cooling is the principal cause for temperature decreasing with altitude. Were it not for ultraviolet absorbing ozone concentrated in the stratosphere, temperature would decrease monotonically towards space. The larger the radiative opacity of the atmosphere, 
the steeper the temperature gradient. Dry convective instability limits the temperature gradient to be no steeper than 10 degrees centigrade per kilometer. But latent heat released by condensing water vapor in the troposphere limits the moist convective temperature gradient to be approximately five to six degrees centigrade per kilometer. Tropospheric temperatures are driven by insulation, water vapor condensation, and advective transport of energy. Stratospheric temperatures are close to radiative equilibrium, balanced by solar ozone heating and thermal CO2 cooling. Slide six. At any latitude in pressure, the mass stream function is computed as the northward mass flux integrated over longitude and from the top of the atmosphere down to the desired pressure level. This diagnostic is designed to show the latitudinal and vertical transport of air. Negative blue values show counterclockwise airflow on the graphs, and positive red values show clockwise flow. The negative values in the southern hemisphere and positive values in the northern hemisphere near the equator are described as branches of the Hadley cell. The rising warm air between the branches indicate the position of the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone, which varies on either side of the equator and is driven by the seasonal variation of maximum insulation. The ITCZ is where the largest rainstorms occur. Rising moist air condensing below the tropopause causes the summer Asian monsoons. Just outside the branches of the Hadley cell are the weaker feral cells in which air flows in the opposite direction from the adjacent Hadley cell branch. Sinking dry air between the Hadley and feral cells tends to cause arid and desert conditions on the surface. Outside the feral cells are the polar cells, which are weaker still. Slide seven. Zonal wind means eastward component of velocity. Conservation of angular momentum causes the surface winds from the Hadley cell heading toward the equator to be redirected toward the west. This causes the tropical westward trade winds. Similarly, poleward heading winds in the feral cell are redirected eastward. Angular momentum discrepancies between the tropics and mid latitudes also drive the mid latitude jets. The jet streams are narrow on any individual day, but because they meander, the eastward velocity is more spread out during a month. A property of fluid dynamics is that to transport fluid through a medium, it is most efficient to transport the fluid by means of a narrow jet. The stratospheric zonal wind velocity reverses sign with season. The tropical jet streams maintain their eastward direction, but are substantially stronger during the winter season. The logarithmic vertical coordinate in the plot is pressure in millibars. Slide eight. The amount of water vapor that air can hold is an exponential function of temperature rising as temperature increases, and it is inversely proportional to pressure. The dependence is governed by the clausius clapeyron formula. Approximately for every increase in temperature by 10 degrees centigrade, water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere approximately doubles. Thus, as the planet warms, the atmosphere can and will retain more water vapor. Water vapor is an important greenhouse gas, and its contribution to the greenhouse effect is stronger than that of CO2. 
Water vapor is the most important climate feedback responding to the imposed forcing of CO2. In the four times CO2 scenario illustrated to the right, the water vapor contribution to the global greenhouse warming far exceeds the CO2 contribution. Slide nine. Evaporation is greater in the tropics than over high latitudes and greater over oceans or lakes than over ground or ice surfaces. It occurs more readily when the air is warm and the surface is warm. Evaporation of liquid water or ice cools the ground and the latent energy of water vapor escapes into the atmosphere. Moist air is transported upward into the atmosphere and also toward the poles and to drier continents. Precipitation occurs when moist air cools, condensing water vapor to rain or snow. Some of the water on continents runs into lakes and rivers and eventually into the ocean as opposed to evaporating. Slide 10. With severe climate change, the distribution of groundwater on Earth will be altered. Some lakes may dry up, while others may expand. The present climate model predicts that with four times CO2, the eastern half of the United States will become wetter and the western half will be drier. The Amazon and African rainforests will be wetter but Greenland and Antarctica will be drier. Soil moisture is determined largely by the balance between precipitation and evaporation. In a warmer climate, atmosphere can hold more water vapor, implying the likelihood of increased precipitation. But a warmer climate also increases the efficiency of evaporation. Shifting patterns in the atmosphere circulation also play an important role. Slide 11. Sensible heat flux is proportional to the difference between the ground temperature and the surface air temperature. Greater wind speed increases this flux and greater atmospheric stability decreases it. Greater instability leads to convection cells and eventually to turbulence in which sinking cold air encounters the ground that increases the sensible heat flux. Water vapor heat flux includes both the sensible and latent heat content of the vaporized groundwater and ice that escapes into the atmosphere. Negative water vapor flux over Antarctica indicates that dew exceeds evaporation, where moist air condenses onto the ground, warming it because latent heat is released onto the ground. The sensible and latent heat fluxes are important mechanisms along with radiation in establishing the vertical as well as the horizontal temperature structure of the atmosphere. Slide 12. Clouds are minute particles of liquid water or ice suspended in the air. Clouds are important regulators of the Earth's global energy balance. During the day, clouds reflect sunlight, thus cooling the planet. Clouds at nighttime keep the planet warm by reducing the escape of thermal radiation to space. High altitude clouds are typically cirrus clouds made up of ice particles. They reflect some sunlight, but their greater effect is to reduce the outward going thermal radiation by absorbing some of it and re-emitting it back down toward the surface. For optically thick low altitude clouds, reflection of solar radiation is more important. Since cloud thermal emission depends on the cloud temperature, and the temperature of low clouds is close to that of the ground, low clouds are less able to reduce the outgoing thermal radiation. In general, high clouds warm the surface and low clouds cool it. Slide 13. 
Albedo is the ratio of the spectrally integrated reflected sunlight divided by incident sunlight. The global albedo cannot be computed by area weighting the local albedo. Instead, both the numerator and denominator need to be area weighted separately, and then the ratio will be an accurate representation of the global albedo. The main difference between planetary albedo, computation at the top of the atmosphere, and ground albedo is the intervening large influence of the atmosphere. Clouds, aerosols, and Raleigh scattering by air molecules are the principal atmospheric contributors to planetary albedo. After large volcanic eruptions, sulfuric acid particles in the stratosphere can also reflect sunlight to increase the planetary albedo and thus cool the planet. For the most part, the atmosphere acts to increase the albedo, although in some locations like Greenland and Antarctica, the surface albedo is higher than the planetary albedo. Slide 14. The global annual insulation incidence on the Earth is about 340 watts per meter squared. About 100 watts is reflected back to space, leaving 240 watts to be absorbed by the Earth. Of this, about 68 watts is absorbed by the atmosphere and 172 watts by the ground surface. There is an additional one watt per meter squared globally that is received by the ground from warm rain. To maintain global energy balance equilibrium at the surface, 173 watts per meter squared must be extracted from the surface by sensible latent and thermal radiation heat fluxes. Most of the solar radiation is absorbed in the tropical regions, with progressively less solar radiation absorbed at higher latitudes. By comparison, thermal radiation is more uniformly distributed with latitude. This implies that there is atmospheric and ocean transport of heat horizontally, moving heat energy from the tropics to the poles. For the planet as a whole to maintain energy equilibrium, 240 watts per meter squared must be emitted out to space via thermal radiation. The Earth presently is not in equilibrium. We estimate that about 0.7 watts per meter squared more sunlight is being absorbed by the Earth than is emitted to space by thermal radiation. The planet will need to warm to increase outgoing thermal radiation until it matches the incoming solar. Slide 15. The greenhouse effect measured in watts per meter squared is defined as the difference between the upward thermal radiation emitted from the surface minus the thermal radiation emitted at top of atmosphere out to space. The strength of the greenhouse effect is a measure of the heat trapping efficiency of spectral absorption by greenhouse gases and by thermal radiation cloud opacity. In the present model, contributions to the greenhouse effect are roughly 55% by water vapor, 22% by clouds, 18% by CO2, and 5% by other minor non-condensing greenhouse gases such as methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. The water vapor and clouds are by far the largest contributors to the greenhouse effect. Their contributions are feedback effects in response to changing temperature. The Clausius-Clapeyron formula causes water vapor to increase more rapidly than the applied radiative forcing due to the increase in CO2 and other non-condensing greenhouse gases. Slide 16. The climate of the Earth is strongly controlled by the amount of atmospheric CO2, 
although the range used here, one eighth to 256 times current amount is extreme. Such failures may have occurred in the geological past for the earth. With CO2 reduced to one eighth, the oceans become completely ice covered, reminiscent of the snowball earth conditions some 750 million years ago. As CO2 amount is increased, the global mean surface temperature rises steadily, reaching life-threatening values for the more extreme amounts. With increasing CO2, the tropopause rises, allowing more water vapor to higher altitudes, thus enhancing the strength of the greenhouse effect. This is reflected in the increase in stratospheric relative humidity right panel as CO2 increases. Slide 17. The, the reference geoid for the ocean surface is a level where the horizontal surface pressure gradient force is zero. This includes effects due to variations of both gravity and of the Earth's rotation. The ocean surface height differs, left panel, from this geoid because of wind stresses and local steric expansion. The reductions in stability of the water column and momentum stresses at the top cause mixing in the upper ocean layers down to the mixed layer depth. Panel on the right, I guess. There is a deficiency in the present ocean model in that there is insufficient mixing in the Labrador Sea and too much mixing in the Greenland Sea. These deficiencies arise from the complex interactions of the ocean circulation with sea ice formation, melting, and transport, and with changing freshwater inputs and radiative environment. Improved ocean modeling is a key factor in improving climate model reliability. Slide 18. Surface salinity is low in the Arctic Ocean because of the significant freshwater river input and low evaporation. Salinity is also low adjacent to California because the ocean temperature there is cold, which reduces evaporation. On the other hand, surface air crossing the Sahara and Arabian deserts is very dry. Uh, when this air encounters the ocean, it causes enhanced evaporation, resulting in greater salinity. High salinity water escaping at lower depths of the Mediterranean Sea at Gibraltar spreads all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Salinity, because it directly affects the density of seawater, it and temperature are the principal controlling factors that affect the global circulation of the ocean, and thus the transport of heat energy from the tropics toward the poles by the ocean. Slide 19. In both the atmosphere and ocean, horizontal velocity is prognostic whereas a vertical velocity is computed diagnostically from the convergence of horizontal mass fluxes. This computation is sensitive to numerical instabilities and checkerboarding, which is reduced by numerical filters, although it is still noticeable in the atmosphere. Most of the large vertical velocities occur near mountainous regions in the atmosphere, left panel, and next to coastlines in the ocean, right panel. Both water vapor and latent heat energy, which are generated at the surface by evaporation, must first be transported vertically before they are dispersed horizontally by the atmospheric winds. In the oceans, near surface and deep water circulation patterns are quite different and must be bridged in key locations by vertical velocities. Slide 20. 
The side of the Earth facing the moon is more strongly pulled by the moon's gravity, and the opposite side is pulled more weakly. These three-dimensional variations of gravity by the moon and sun cause the Earth's tides. The maximum horizontal tidal acceleration is about 10 to the minus 7 meters per second squared. That's 10 to the minus 7 meters per second squared. Over three hours, the change in velocity can be as large as one millimeter per second at various locations. So click on the uh, PowerPoint figure to activate the lunar and solar tide movie. Tides were ignored when the video starts. Ocean surface height was relatively calm, but then tides are invoked. Notice the counterclockwise motion in the North Atlantic. The model's change in ocean, ocean surface altitude is too large compared with observations near some coastlines. It may be that the model, model's square cut ocean cells prevent ocean water from sliding along the coast. Other problems uh, are still to be discovered. Uh, that's basically the end of my talk. Uh, I don't know how long this will last. Great. It's almost done. Um, thank you so much, Gary, for um, this presentation. Um, as we did before, um, we're going to open it up to some questions, and you can use the chat function uh, in Zoom to ask us some questions. We're going to monitor um, any questions that you might have. Um, and in the meantime, um, we're going to turn it on. We have a question over here uh, for Gary. So I'm going to turn it on over to David. Gary, thanks for the presentation, for showing us all the various fields that models have to produce and we're producing for the atmosphere and the ocean. I guess the models were uh, generated by solving the basic conservation quantities, assuming we sort of knew the various physics terms. The question I have for you is a speculative one. Since you were sort of here at the beginning of building global climate models, and you've seen how they progressed for the last 40 years, the basic use of these models, in addition to understanding how the climate system works today, is in making predictions for the future, ideally out to the end of the century. What would you say is the likelihood, and I guess I gather this is definitely speculative, that our climate models will be able to give a good assessment of what is going to happen in the future before it actually happens, which is what we're hoping for. Well, as one of my things mentioned, we really don't know what the, uh, you know, the composite feedback factor for the Earth is. We're too early in the change of CO2 to know from observations what it will be. Um, and as I, we know that different climate models show large variations, factors of two or larger difference in the climate, the, the, cli the composite feedback factor. Uh, to tell you the truth, I think in terms of the global future composite temperature change, I think we might do almost as well with a piece of paper and a pencil on guessing what it will be. Models, however, their main benefit that I see is once we know what happens, the models can tell you, well, why the, can tell you how it happened or, or what's causing it. I actually think they're, they're better at, I don't think they're, I, I almost think there may not be sufficiently reliable for future predictions, but once you know what the result is, they can tell you what caused it. Great. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Also for, I want to thank you also for a really wonderful talk um, as, part, as part of the webinar. Um, I'd like to ask you a similar question to, to what I asked Judith. You mentioned a couple of areas 
uh, that are in active uh, model development, the oceans and including the uh, ocean modeling and including the tides, the, the last wonderful video that you showed. But what would you say are the, you know, the top few areas the, in the climate modeling um, field that you feel you would say really, you know, still are active areas for improvement? I think the main thing that uh, needs work actually is the grid itself. And uh, too many models are lat land models, which have problems at the poles and other just, you know, poor things. Uh, I don't like the cube sphere grids because they're, um, the shape of the grid cells are parallelograms as opposed to squares. Uh, I think the icosahedral grid eventually will be the ultimate grid that will be used. And there aren't enough people doing the work on the icosahedral grid. And I feel um, I was told about them 25 years ago and I didn't pay attention to it. But over the past five years, I'm starting to look into them and I am um, uh, think eventually we'll have a version of uh, model E, or it'll be called model I for icosahedral grid, uh, I guess, uh, but it may take 10 years. Wow. And the reason is that that's, the reason is that that's going to then improve the calculations of the, of, of those uh, fundamental <laughs> equations that David was saying. So we're going to, we're just going to be able to have it, have it, have those solutions to the equations much more accurate. That, that's what I think, yes. Great. All right, students. I think Gary also. <laughs> All right. We also, I think it's a wonderful challenge to the students who are listening. Um, uh, we need, we need the, we need uh, all uh, folks who are all students interested in math to, uh, to help come and help Gary work on this problem for the next 10 years. Great. So we want to just say thank you to everyone for um, participating in today's webinar. Um, we're going to make this, uh, both of these presentations available online on the Consortium for Climate Risk in the Urban Northeast website. Um, we have posted, uh, we're in the process, I believe, of posting the, the um, presentations from last month's webinars. Um, if they're not already up, they will be up in the next few days. And then the ones from today will be posted following those ones. Um, our next webinar in the series is taking place on November 13th. Um, so we'll be sending out invites for those in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're really excited to have you guys on here today and to join us again next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.